artist friends and visitors of Monet Cafe. This is Susan Jenkins and I am so glad to be back in my studio. I had a little trip and I got away from painting for a few days and man do I miss it. I know you guys understand what I'm talking about. Once you get that artistic bug, you just can't shake it. <laughs> so I'm back and I want to share um, another experiment. You know how they call people a mad scientist. I think I'm somewhat of a mad artist because I like the experimentation process. Uh, almost as much as just painting. So it's just always fun to find new ways to do things. So what I'm going to do today, and I didn't plan on this, but I've been wanting to play around a little bit more with my acrylic inks. Okay, they're the Daler Rowney Ar Acrylic Artist Ink. And some of you may be familiar with the channel um, of artist Bethany Fields. She's the one who I saw this the first time, and I've only barely played around with these. And I'm not going to do it quite in the way that she does. She uses it more for a value painting. Like, for example, with this reference photo I'm using from Paint My Photo, um, she would um, basically get in her darker values. Um, she might do an underpainting of sorts and then use the acrylic ink just to get those dark darks with it. Um, because they do uh, work pretty, um, give, give some pretty dark values. Now, what I'm going to do is I love our technique we kind of, um, I kind of stumbled upon, and I think some other people had done it, but I had never done it, where I used watercolor paper. Using watercolor paper is a great way to save money because it's fairly inexpensive. And buying the pastel papers, oh, by the way, this will end up having pastel applied to it. This is another pastel painting demonstration. So um, I'm going to do a combination of things before I prepare it for pastels. The acrylic inks I'm going to use on the watercolor paper to get some darker values. As you know, I've done watercolor underpaintings before, before applying the pastel. And um, I've done some using the wax pastels on watercolor paper, but I've never used the acrylic inks underneath, kind of as an underpainting, on watercolor paper. So again, it's going to be an experiment. But I'm going to be able, I think, to get darker values laid down on the initial layers than just watercolor, which dries a lot lighter. So it's gonna be interesting. Once I get the acrylic inks on, then I'm going to um, let them dry, and I will, I'll see where I go from there. I may just go ahead and apply the clear gesso product, which actually makes your watercolor paper uh, able to receive pastels. You get that grit on your paper. So that's what I'll be doing afterwards. I'm not sure if I'm going to do something in between um, the acrylic inks and the gesso, but we'll see. Also, I, I wanted to mention, I bought this color only because another one was out of stock. I noticed a lot of artists use one called Purple Lake. This one is called Velvet Violet, and I really wanted the Purple Lake. It's a darker value than this one, but I'm going to use this one. So I have um, the violet, a velvet violet, that's like a tongue twister. Then I have this one, which is sepia. And this one is um, burnt umber. And this one is antelope, oh, antelope brown. So they're all pretty, pretty dark values. I did playing around with it back here. And uh, hopefully it's going to come out dark enough on here. So we're going to try, and I'm going to try to talk a little bit through this. I know you guys have uh, requested that. So all right, let's see. Time to experiment. All right, so I'm ready to go. I decided to do away with these clips. I use these sometimes with watercolors. Um, when I just started doing a little teaching with them, it helps to just kind of move them around. But I went back to my taping it down technique, which uh, watercolor will or watercolor paper will warp. So I'm trying to prevent it from warping a lot on me right now. Okay, so all I'm going to do is I have this little tray that is just from a Chinese restaurant. I use these little trays, the disposable trays, uh, quite often for different art projects. And I think this will work well for applying the um, acrylic ink. I also, I'm not quite sure how this is going to behave with water. I may want to dilute it some, so I have me some water here. And I have me some various uh, different size brushes, flat and round here. So uh, again, this is a total experimentation process for me and we'll just see how it goes. All right, let's do it.
bigger brush for this part here. Uh, bigger brushes are better. Uh, use the biggest brush you possibly can often to um, get your, your underpainting in. Alright, now I'm going to try to use some of this um, a different color with some water. Let me see how that behaves. A lot of these colors look kind of similar except for the purple one. I've been applying the different colors but um, the purple one is the only one that looks different. Okay, so got a little bit of that in there now. Now as you know I typically work from darker values to uh, lighter with pastel. You can get down some pretty good darks and um, still get light pastels on top of it. Now I think for some reason my my purple was not coming out very good with the eyedropper. I don't know if it's clogged or what, but I'm going to I'm actually even though the sky is light, I'm actually going to apply a coat of this purple up there because we can make it darker and then apply the lighter clouds and I think this purple when I applied it was a light enough value to work for kind of an underpainting for the sky. So let me try that. Now I'm curious, um, uh, kind of liking this, that I might would want to um, get some uh, acrylic inks that are in the family of reds, and um, you know, just some different different hues to work with here. Probably the best thing here. Now I'm trying it with water. Let's see what happens. It is watercolor paper, so I think I'll take the water. And you guys know I like drips. And we'll see how that behaves. Yep, that's going to start mixing on there. So you don't want to go over your, your other color as you come down because it's going to blend it up into the sky. Now I may need a little bit more of this, this purple here. And I'm really curious about the, uh, I believe it's called Purple Lake. It's the one that I definitely, definitely want to try. Now while I didn't want this color blending up into the sky, I don't mind this purple blending down into the background or the um, the land and the background trees. Kind of interesting, but I got to be careful not to drag that dark up into it. That's pretty dry now, so it's not doing it anymore. Okay, interesting, interesting. I kind of like the different um, effects back here of the um, the water that I mixed with it, it gives kind of a variation. Now I actually am kind of liking that purple again, maybe a little bit more of that on top of this. Now again, I'm not sure, quite sure how this is going to behave uh, with much water in the brush. Let me get some of the water out of the brush. Let's see how this purple behaves. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Because you know things um, in the distance get more shades of uh, cooler colors and purples are always good for that. Probably don't want to do too much more of that because I don't want to lighten those foreground trees. Now I'm going to go back over those with um, um, darker pastels to make those even darker or I might just do more of this acrylic ink. Um, but anyway, I'm sort of liking this. Yeah, this is pretty interesting and I picked a very simple reference photo just for the fact that this was an experiment. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I don't like some of the lines I have going on in here. So let me see if I can darken this land mass up a bit because I know I am going to lighten this a lot with the pastels and um, get the lighter values of greens on there. Sometimes I kind of like getting almost geometric shapes in. All right. Well, that's probably good enough. Just enough to get um, just kind of some basic values in there and uh, start applying the pastels. Now I'm not sure how watercolors would behave on top of this. Uh, I, I think the, the good thing about acrylic inks is um, if you use it on like UART paper, 
it doesn't um, take up the tooth of the paper. So you still have all of that good texture to work with with your pastel um, because it doesn't fill up the tooth. Now there is no tooth at this point to this watercolor paper, so I'm not worried about that at all, but I'm not quite sure how watercolor will behave on top of this. Let me just do another experiment. I've got a little travel palette of watercolors here and um, just going to, my water's gotten a little bit dirty, but let's just play with something. Let's see, where do I have like a, a little bit to the top of the sky. I've got a little bit of a, a darker uh, sky blue. I am going to have to pause and clean this water because it's a little dirty. All right, so just walking away to clean my water, I was able to back up something I typically like to do, just to back up and check my values. And um, I actually like this. I like the um, how you can quickly get in the darks um, and big shapes. So the main thing with starting a painting, big shapes, get your values in, then you're ready to go. And don't get too fussy on anything. All right, so now back to my experiment of seeing, see how dry this gets. It dries pretty quickly. This is pretty dry up here. So I'm just going to attempt to apply a little bit of a, this has actually some more purpley blues in it. Let me get a blue that's not too bold right here. All right, I'm just gonna check out what this does how the watercolor behaves on top of this, maybe even more water. Get some of the, um, there's, a, there's a really dark um, bottom to a cloud here that's kind of going over um, and has some various uh, distant clouds back here. Oh yeah, that's kind of interesting. And up here, there's a little bit more of these blues. Now I can fix any of this with the um, pastels. So I'm just getting in some different shapes. There's a nice brilliant white cloud here and here, which is why I've kind of left those a little bit blank there. Again, you're just, the neat thing is you can, you have more freedom than you think if you work big um, to small because you can kind of move things around and change it as you go and it adds to that painterly feel if you don't have everything just so 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 fixed all the time all right now i got a nice little light back here okay it's even darker in here maybe add a little bit more of this blue it's actually a dark bluish purple that i might achieve with the pastels and it goes right over these trees again i need to s try not to get too fussy with the underpainting um, because it's really just more about the values. Okay, so that's interesting. I, I'm kind of thinking this is neat. I'm going to blend it in a little bit. I don't want it so stark. Okay. All right, well, let's just kind of play around with this now and see what else we can do. All right, I think I do want um, some darker darks in this foreground. I know that Typically with underpaintings, um, especially with like Karen Margolis's uh, uh, demonstrations when she teaches just so well, she always says to put down some dirt, some dark darks, and she typically does that with the pastels and then gradually layers um, the lighter pastels on top of that. But I'm going to go ahead and try to get maybe some darker darks in here um, without using pastels, using these acrylic inks. And this is also an experiment on how much of these acrylic inks to use because they're kind of expensive. I'm trying to look at my reference photo here and um, go along with the values of what's in these grasses. So again, this is more just experimenting. I probably will end up covering up most of this with pastel, but I do want to get some of these really, really good darks in the foreground because there are, and notice I'm still using a big brush here. 
but I'm sometimes using kind of the edge of it. Some really good darks here. Now I don't know if you can see um, in the reference photo that I'll put up here on the top, but there's little bits of water in here that I'm going to try to accomplish with the pastels. All right, the base of these trees definitely needs more of this. And it's going to have some pastels and grasses um, just growing up around this. So. Okay, let's see. Again, this is just a value study, but I do think these trees in the background here, they are, this is um, lightest value, darkest values. Um, I'm sorry, let, let me go to the next one. Lightest value, next to lightest values are these grasses and of course this water, that's gonna be the lightest values in here. Then the next is going to be these back trees. And then I need those even darker than that. This is that color that's a little bit of that. It's got more of that ochre um, type of color in it. And then of course the darkest, darkest are gonna be those trees, the big grouping of trees and um, the foreground grasses. Okay, so again, just about getting a value study in here. All right, so that should be something, something we can work with. So now we have discovered we can do watercolor, um, acrylic ink on watercolor paper and um, apply watercolor on top of it. Now I'm going to dry it and apply the um, clear gesso, which will act as a um, uh, something that you can use to apply pastel to. It's going to give it some grit. All right, so let me quit fiddling with this before I mess it up. <laughs> okay, so time to dry it. Okay, so now I am going to be applying the clear gesso, this is by Liquitex, um, to the surface of the watercolor paper. And from some of my past videos, I'll try to include those in here so you can watch them. We have discovered that you absolutely can create your own pastel paper uh, using this product on watercolor paper. It's a much more economical way to make pastel paper. It won't give you quite as many layers as say UART paper or some of the other pastel papers, but it suffices, especially if you're just doing a small piece like I'm doing here. So all I'm doing is putting some of the um, clear gesso onto a sponge um, applicator and I'm just going to start applying it. I'm gonna apply it pretty liberally, but you just wanna apply it. You can do more than one layer if you want. And um, it's going to allow uh, or create that pastel surface. Ooh, I got a lot right there. All right. Better put my glasses on so I can actually see how much I'm getting on here. And I'm not sure how this is going to behave with the acrylic ink. It doesn't look like it's bleeding. See, I went over the dark and it's not, it's dry. It's not going anywhere. That's a good thing. Okay, so, and sometimes um, your lines um, might show a little bit, but that actually to me adds to that artistic painterly feel. All right, I'm getting a, a good coat of this on here. We'll be ready to go soon. Okay, so now you can see how I have the gesso applied. It's dry, and um, as you can hear, there's a sanded surface here. So I can apply pastels now to this. And I thought I'd go ahead and share with you how I, I'm trying to keep the shadow away, how I go about um, picking out my palette. As you can see, I have my reference photo right here next to it, and the reference photo is very dark. Um, it's going to be one of those dramatic paintings. And I, I can already see from what I've applied that I've, the color um, families or hue is going to be a little different. This has lots of greens and kind of some pale, um, just pale blues and gray colors. And I definitely want it to be more dramatic than that, but I want to keep that value is correct in the, in the photograph, okay? So I definitely want to keep the values correct, but I can get a little bit more creative with color. So I'm going to go about picking a pastel palette right now. 
out of my pastel, handy dandy pastel drawer you may have seen from some of my previous videos. It works really well for me because I can just take the drawers out individually and lay them out and don't have to take up so much space. So um, let me pick out a palette that will work well with this and then I'll share my color choices. All right, so here are my initial pastel choices. Again, I want a little bit more of a dramatic um, painting or scene. And I'm analyzing some of the things in the photo right now. And we know we, of course, have the sky with the, um, the lightest value in the clouds. So I've got some a little bit of purples and blues. And the lightest light is going to be here, which is going to be some of those uh, lightest parts to the clouds. But we've got some gray, more neutral tones in those clouds, too. So that's why I sat this one over here. And um, this may even work in some of those back fields as well. There's like uh, across the back field, well, of course, we've got our trees in the background that are going to, at first, I'm going to apply a darker value, typically, and then I put something lighter over it to make that distance, a cooler, um, lighter value than the other trees. And so I've got some of the greens here for the grasses. And again, a little bit darker values here. Um, I will put down the darkest darks first. And in that distant field, again, I've got um, uh, to add some punch to some things. Um, I, I see in my mind I'm seeing some orange maybe it's just because I've done my underpainting with that um, acrylic ink that gave it that orangey um, glow and these are going to be the colors of the the water those little bits of water that's going to be one of the lighter um, values and uh, perhaps a little bit more of this blue and I just love purple gotta throw some purple in there so I've got of course my darker values all in in here that I'm going to use to lay down first and then just gradually start playing around with it all. And I don't know, I love that color pink. And for some reason, I guess just looking at this here, I just see where I might can get that in somewhere in here. So anyway, it's all fun. And uh, again, this is an experiment anyway. So let's just play and have fun. All right, time to get started with the pastels. Oh, let me rub this again. Hear that surface? It's sanded, yay. Okay, well, I'm going to get my um, darkest values in first. And uh, then this group of trees that looks like a big old clump, <laughs> I'm going to carve it in with the sky. So uh, let me get those in first. Again, I'm working from an extremely dark reference photo and I already have some dark darks on here, but I think you'll see when I start adding pastels, they even go on darker than the acrylic ink. And I'm having to bend down here. My reference photo was in a kind of awkward place. And I've noticed too, uh, the photograph actually had a better composition than what I'm doing here. It was like it was taller, and so it um, was um, just better as far as the rule of thirds goes. I have my horizon line a little bit closer to the middle than I would like. I normally like it a little lower, but again, I'm just working with what I have here for the um, general idea. Okay, these trees are going to get lighter and just put down a dark value for now. All right, let me get some of these dark darks in the foreground here. I think I'm gonna have to lift my um, painting up a little bit to work on it at the bottom. go ahead and place in where this water is just so I I have it um, and I don't get too carried away and paint over top of it.
looks like I can't tell if that's water or land back there behind these trees but it's it's interesting so I may add something back in there too you can um, the more you do this and I still need to paint a whole lot more but the more you learn to veer from your reference photo and go off of maybe something you've painted before or seen before okay there's a dark clump of um, like a line going through here that looks like it's where water is is going or flowing and um, and this is a pretty small just a little five by seven um, painting here so it's hard to work with these chunky pastels sometimes but this looks like it might be where some water is um, flowed through and I think I still need some darker darks in some of these places And again, I'm working with clear gesso, so um, you got to be a little bit careful and make sure you don't overdo it with your um, application, especially with these Terry Ludwigs because they fill up tooth very quickly. Now I'm adding a little bit more of um, a, another darker value in here to give this interest, okay? Even though I am going to apply some greens there at the top. Um, this is going to make it not just one solid color. It's going to be a little more interesting. Okay. All right. Now, let's see here. I think I'm going to go ahead and start getting in some of these greens in this back field. And actually, like I said, there are some lighter values back in here. I'm just testing this value. It's like there's... um. From these clouds above it's like it's kind of shining down um, or reflecting down on this field below to give it a lighter value it's just a little bit here so I'm just kind of getting this in like I said I'm almost just checking it but again just getting general values in to, to make things um, somewhat correct at the beginning and then then you can start getting more detailed and uh, adding more hues and colors. And all of this background feel too, I don't want to get too carried away. I have a tendency sometimes to add too much back here and keep blending and blending and blending and sometimes less is more. All right, now I think I'm going to go ahead. Uh, that's I think that's a nice value back here. It's almost like it's that where the sun has, um, it's late afternoon and it's been a rainy day and the rain has passed, but there's still this um, darkness that is just about before evening. That's what I'm seeing anyway. All right. But this may be too green for these background trees, but that's all right. These are definitely going to be lighter than these trees. So, and they're usually lighter at the tops than they are at the bases. And some of this can be carved in a little bit with the uh, sky that we do. Okay, so there we just got a little bit of those background trees. And now we've got a richer green right behind where this water is and this dark, these are like the grasses that are growing up um, where this water is carving through. And behind it is this um, section of greener, almost like the tops of these grasses. It may even have a little bit more highlights than that. Sometimes you just want to suggest things because the eye and the brain, the brain will figure it out if you get things in correct with value and correct with how nature really works, you know. Uh, you definitely don't have to put everything in. I actually
actually really like this right here um, without any pastel on it at all. So uh, I don't often leave that much without pastel on it, but I'm going to work my way down and see how it behaves. Now what I'm doing here is I'm using a harder pastel, I believe this is a Rembrandt, and notice it's just kind of a light lavender, and I'm using it to blend some of the um, texture out of these clouds up here. I like some of it, but I'm just blending it a bit. So that the eye isn't going everywhere when you look at the painting. If you've got texture all over the place, it's like the eye just isn't led gently into anything. It's just kind of mesmerized and overwhelmed, I guess is a better word. All right. All right, now this might be, yeah, see how this light lavender? Next to that really light background there, it makes those nice distant clouds that are kind of... Um, just with perspective are going off further into the distance. Again, this, um, what do you call it, a thundercloud or whatever, it's, um, can 
and it looks like just after it's rained, it is the lightest value along with maybe that water when we add some of the reflections that are actually going to be the reflections from this cloud. And I don't, again, I don't want to suggest it so perfectly. I just want to give it a little bit of um, where the eye just is kind of has interest to it, but you don't have to go analyze it. There's a little bit in here. just want to take a look and check this value back here. I think it's going to be too light, but you know sometimes adding a little bit of lightness over the trees in the distance um, is a neat little effect, but I think that's too light. I like that. Um, I like the way it was already, letting the white of the paper show through. Oops, I may have messed it up. Let me get a clean brush and see if I can just brush that off. Yeah, there's um, really something that's about watercolor and the watercolor paper is that um, there is a glow behind the whiteness of the paper that you almost can't get when you apply pastel on the top. I see I have darkened that. Um, I may try to do something to get that back, but I liked that little glow I had going on back there. I can, I can probably add. Uh, this may be a little too dark. Let me check it in the tree. pretty good. You see how I carved out that tree with this value right here? Yeah, that's going to work. Okay, and I'm going to add a little bit more, um, a lighter pastel still on top of that to reclaim that glow. Alright, now I want some variety in these trees. Even though in the reference photo these are sticking up, there's a clump, these are sticking up, goes down. I want to give a little bit more variety in them than they have in the picture. Um, and I'm still not an expert at doing this tree carving thing, but, oops, a little too much there. But, um, I still have fun with it. I am going to add some green kind of to the tops of these trees. So I might better do that before I try to do too much carving. This is richer. And with trees, you don't paint leaves. You really paint shapes. <laughs> because this far away, you are not going to see individual leaves on a tree. Your brain says it's individual leaves, so you try to paint it that way. But um, it's really not. And I don't want to get too fussy with this either. I'm just going to some hints here of how the suns and the clouds, the light up there is shining down on these trees. And usually it's on the ends of the, the branches and things. Purples are always good in like shadowy areas. Um, if there's a little bit of light reflecting, getting a little purple underneath. Usually the darkest darks are going to be closer to the ground. Oh, I love that purple. That's so pretty. All right, I think I might establish some of that back in here. You see how this is a lighter value than this? So this purple will be good for these... Um, little areas I was saying how there's like obviously some water flowing through different spots and this purple also looks pretty good coming down sporadically in between where the darkest darks are to these roots 
or these grasses, the ones that are going down to the ground. I also like this purple maybe a little bit back here, not too much. Kind of ties it all together and gives it harmony. All right. Now I think I might go ahead and add where these lighter colors of the water are. Kind of coming down, reflecting from where the, the sky is. Again, these are chunky pastels for such a little painting. That's okay. Sometimes working with bigger is better. Yeah, <laughs> that sounded funny. Of course, that's the common expression everybody says, but it is good in art too. Um, to always use the biggest brush you possibly can and um, sometimes larger strokes and larger pastels and I don't like how fixed that little part is there. I'm just going to add. Again, you don't want any lines and I'm going to cover some of that up with grasses. But notice how I had to get a little bit of this blue in there too um, because water has shadows as well. Again, it looks like there's maybe like some lightness back here, but I don't want to go overboard with it. All right, word of advice, move on if you're getting too fussy with things. Okay, I'm going to check this green. This is a little bit more of a dead kind of a green instead of this warm green here. And um, it's going to be um, I'm seeing that a little bit more on this side here where they're cooler a little bit more away from the Sun and there's just a little hints of some of this they're not um, it's not a lot of it so I'm just keeping it rather impressionistic here and I typically like to keep things in the foreground more impressionistic because it causes the eye to flow into the painting whereas if you have so much detail right in here you know um all these little leaves then it's almost like it's a barricade to um to letting the eye just enter in okay again i'm constantly analyzing values but you can get creative with color to a degree now i did say i was curious about this pink here because you notice the sky has got these um, more of lavender colors in here and I'm not sure I think this value is a little too light no it's okay just in a couple of spots sometimes these grasses have actually like some orangey colors in them actually these pinks are gonna look good in these trees too just a little because that that sky is reflecting even down on the trees Again, I'm keeping kind of a light touch because I'm trying really hard not to overwork this. Okay, some of these pinks and things in the distance don't usually get um, warmer. They get cooler in color. But, um, and I don't really see that this has any pink flowers to put in that distance, so I'm going to hesitate putting a warmer color back there. All right, now again, I really did like this orange. I may even need something a little darker. I've got this darkest, darkest, um, it's like a, a red, um, much deep, deep, deep magenta leaning towards warmer. Um, and, and it's a beautiful um, value here or color. And I think to get some of that richness up front, I'm gonna add a little bit of this because it's warm, it looks good in the foreground. And if you could see my eyes, even though it looks like I'm randomly placing things, I am looking back constantly at the reference photo, checking for values. Now behind where this water is, I noticed I needed some darker values where these 
grasses behind it are growing up. It has little um, meanderings, like it's not going to make a straight line here. So you kind of um, go in the direction that that water seems to be cutting through everything. And this is like some of it's here too. It's even darker over here. I guess it's because it's behind these trees. We got some more of these little places where water may have cut through. All right, I gotta cool it here because I can get too much quickly if I'm not careful.
All right, now I'm going to try to finish this up because I don't want to overwork it. I uh, recently did an experiment where I took pictures throughout the whole process and just kept going and kept going and realized that about 60% of the way through is usually when I like it the best. So again, I'm gonna try very hard not to overwork this. Now I'm using a piece of uh, pipe insulation foam that you can buy at any hardware store. I just cut it up in little pieces so it's easy to work with. But uh, I'm using kind of this softer side. There's a rough side in the middle here, and then there's a softer side. And it's perfect for blending pastels. Now, again, I like a loose painterly look, and I like the texture. But uh, again, I'm going to reiterate, you don't have to have it everywhere. Sometimes it can be a little much if it's in the sky, too. So I'm, I'm just using this to soften up some of these clouds. And... Um, it already has texture to it because of that clear gesso we applied. I'm, I'm trying not to cover up some of the lighter lights that I liked of that watercolor showing through. And notice how I'm, I'm wiping it off a little bit um, when I uh, go from one um, color to another because I don't want to get the dark color onto the light color. I might reestablish a little bit of those lights to get them back again. I'll use my finger. I have a real advantage with blending with my finger. I know sometimes it hurts people's finger if they, if they use it too much, but if I use a little, it doesn't hurt. I play guitar and my fingers are very calloused, so there's an advantage there. Okay. Don't want to get too much in here. I really do like this, uh, this blue that I've used. It's almost like a, a primrose. So I used to always go, how can I get that color? It looks like a purple. But color is dependent on what it surround, surrounds it. And um, sometimes it looks like a blue, and sometimes it looks like a purple. I'm gonna just loosen up some of these uh, tree edges here so they don't look so harsh. All right, and again, I might try to reestablish a couple of the lights in there. But I just didn't want that much texture. I'll get some more of this right in here. Just a couple little spots for impact. All right, I think that is going to do it for this one. And I definitely am pleased with this experiment. I love how the texture of the gesso and um, just the watercolor paper in general, uh, it worked well to keep that painterly look. You can even see the, the marks of the gesso in there which I like, and um, yeah, this was a successful experiment. I will definitely do this again. Time to sign it.